Hello uh, and welcome to episode 23 of my Stuart's vlog um, and this is the first of the final section of the Stuart's course uh, which considers the glorious revolution. This section is a bit different to the other parts of the Stuart's course as you hopefully know and um, because it focuses in on interpretations of history and particularly the interpretation that suggests that this was really a glorious revolution whether it was um, revolutionary uh, and then also I guess whether it was a good thing. In terms of questions that you get asked, therefore, there's always a question on the Stuart's exam paper about the Glorious Revolution, and it will always feature two extracts, um, which are um, little uh, excerpts from historians. So they're not contemporary sources. You don't need to worry about provenance. They're historians who have done their research and have an idea and have some uh, backup to that idea. And your job is to judge between them. One of the historians ought to be arguing that in some way the Glorious Revolution was quite revolutionary, that a lot changed. Um, and the other historian ought to be, uh, ought to have a different opinion, a different interpretation. And probably that will be to say that things were a bit less revolutionary. Uh, because of the nature of historians and because of the nature of history, and those historians don't always have clear ideas and they're not always completely contradictory to each other. They do sometimes overlap. But that's the basic idea of, uh, of the question and of the, of the topic. There are three areas that the exam would have picked out in terms of revolutionariness. Um, and in this episode, we're going to think a little bit about how the Glorious Revolution happened and look at the first of those areas, which is uh, whether it was revolutionary in terms of its attitudes towards religion. Uh, next time, we'll think about um, the political uh, revolution and how much changed in terms of the way the country was governed. Um, and that's a meteor topic, so I'm saving it for a whole episode by itself. Um, and the third uh, of the episodes will consider the financial implications um, and the economic implications of the Glorious Revolution. So um, let's begin. Um, it all begins in 16, well, it begins before this, I suppose, but in 1688 with the Glorious Revolution itself. Um, this came about um, after three years of James II's rule. And uh, as you know, that became more and more fraught. Um, and kind of culminated with the trial of the seven bishops. That seems to be the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and as a result of the increasing ill feeling, um, initially uh, the, the immortal seven, as they're called, seven uh, politicians wrote to William of Orange, uh, the Dutch Stadtholder, who was married to James II's daughter, uh, Protestant daughter, Mary. Now, uh, you might remember that James II had had a wife called Anne Hyde. Um, in fact, she was the daughter of the Earl of Clarendon. Um, and they'd had two daughters together, um, Mary and Anne, um, who had both grown up by the 1680s. Uh, and they were both Protestants. Um, and, uh, and it's these two daughters that will be his successors. However, in 1688, James II had a son with his second wife. Anne Hyde had died, um, Mary of Modena. Uh, gave birth to a son and the fear was that this son would grow up to be Catholic and be a king and that England would end up having a, a Catholic monarch forever. So the Immortal Seven writes to William um, the uh, William Orange, the Stadtholder of, of the Netherlands and says, uh, please come over here with your Protestant English wife and take over the crown. Um, and they basically invite him to, to effect a, a revolution. Uh, interestingly, in Dutch history, this is seen as being a Dutch invasion. Uh, William of Orange arrives on the 5th of November 1688 with uh, 14,000 Dutch troops uh, in 54 ships and lands, slightly strangely, uh, in Brixham in Torbay. Partly that's to throw William, sorry, to throw James off the scent. He was waiting uh, in the Thames with a similar sized fleet, actually, and a bigger army. Um, but when push comes to shove, uh, William's army is uh, remains and is up for the fight and James's army kind of melts away uh, and lets him down. Um, and so James uh, flees. There's a bit of trouble getting him out of the country. Uh, a lot of people think that actually he was allowed to leave the country because there wasn't really the stomach for executing another king, nor about having a face off between William uh, and James. And so um, James conveniently leaves. Um, and so the revolution is able to take place. Uh, one of the things I should have mentioned about the Immortal Seven is that two of them were Tories and five of them were Whigs. So remember that Whigs are the sort of people who um, are OK with the idea of restricting the powers of the monarch and are developing this idea, this uh, ideology, I suppose, based around John Locke's writings, which suggests that um, there's a contract between the people 
and the uh, the monarch. And that's one of the reasons that they are able to justify to themselves this act of rebellion, this act of revolution against their monarch. Tories have a harder time with that. They believe in the divine right of monarch and, uh, and the um, passing down um, from father to son of, of the crown. Uh, and so for them, uh, it is uh, decided that uh, James II leaving the country was an abdication of the throne and that therefore they were free to fill it with William of Orange. Never mind that they had invited in someone who chased James out of the country. Also, that's one of the reasons for this strange idea that's floated around that uh, William's son, sorry, William's son, James II's son wasn't actually his son. Uh, Mary of Modena had had several stillbirths and miscarriages um, and the idea was sort of circulated, the rumour that this um, son was uh, actually uh, kind of a fake son, someone that a baby that they'd brought in to pretend was theirs. Um, and then again, that allows the Tories off the hook and says, well, we don't even know if it's his son. Um, it's legit for us to invite someone else in. Anyway, so uh, William and Mary are actually made joint monarchs for the only time in British history. Uh, we had two monarchs who were of, in theory, equal status. Um, and it's agreed with them that Anne would be the next in line, assuming William and Mary didn't have any children. They hadn't got children at that point. And in fact, Mary died in 1694 um, without having children. It was even agreed uh, that if William married after Mary died and had children, that Anne would still be the next in line. So Parliament really are starting to tinker already with that line of succession. And that shows already, although we'll talk about this next time, the power shifting away from the monarch and towards Parliament. However, um, in terms of religion, um, there was already uh, some sort of shake up required because William was not an Anglican. Um, he was a Dutch Calvinist. And so he, um, like Charles II, actually, and like James II too, was very much in favour of toleration. Um, and um, initially, there was, uh, and in the Netherlands, actually, um, all Protestant denominations and, denominations and Catholics were tolerated as, as religious types. So he was coming from somewhere where there was um, a large amount of, of toleration. In, initially, there's a uh, debate and uh, William suggests that this could be accommodated through broadening the Church of England um, by uh, kind of like in the, the Republic era where the Church of England became um, a place that rather than having a narrow stream of Anglicanism, that it allowed a, a much greater flexibility in, in Anglicanism um, that meant that Presbyterians perhaps um, and um, some of the other more moderate um, types of uh, Protestantism could uh, thrive in that area and that it, it would become a, a broader church, as the, as the saying said. And these, uh, and to that end, they promoted um, uh, clergy who uh, believed in this. They are called latitudinarians. Latitudinarians, it's a long word, um, and it basically means people who would give latitude, breadth, to the Church of England. Um, the key name that you might want to know about this uh, is John Tillotson. Tillotson is T I L L O T, Tillot, S O N, Son. Tillotson. Uh, he became Archbishop of Canterbury in 1691, um, and he's a good example of how, actually, between 1691 and 1701, the Church of England did start to broaden out. And key in this process, actually, was Mary, uh, Mary II, who herself was um, a pretty tolerant. Uh, Protestant. She went to both uh, dissenter and Anglican services um, and she was quite active in promoting latitudinarians in the Church of England. However, um, Tories in the Church of England are concerned about the rise of Quakers um, and uh, it is true that in this period the number and size of nonconformists did rise um, and so the, the latitude that they're given is, is restricted by that. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the idea, the sort of latitudinarian idea is kind of resisted from within the Church of England. And so um, as a kind of compromise, instead, the Toleration Act uh, is passed. Um, this is um, passed in 1691. Um, and the idea here is to um, at least end the persecution of dissenter groups. So it doesn't remove uh, the laws that have been in place, like the Clarendon Code. They still remain kind of on the books. But if dissenters behave themselves, if they uh, followed certain rules, then they could be assured of not being persecuted actively anymore. 
Uh, Tory flats uh, allowed for um, several things, and I'll, I'll take you through them now. Um, firstly, um, that if you took an oath of allegiance to the king and queen, and if you declared um, against transubstantiation, then you would be free to practice your religion. So, uh, firstly, the Toleration Act does not um, permit Catholicism within uh, Britain. Um, it does, though, mean that uh, other Protestant denominations um, can worship freely. Um, and even to the extent that Quakers, who didn't want to take oaths, were allowed instead to declare uh, their allegiance to the monarch. So it is quite, um, it's quite a step forward in that sense. Secondly, and connected with that, uh, if, you if you applied for a license for a meeting house, then you could meet um, as a Protestant group um, and worship freely without persecution. But you had to keep your doors unlocked so that you couldn't kind of be doing naughty stuff in secret. Um, between 1691 and 1710, two and a half thousand licenses were applied for. There is a thinking that uh, Protestant groups were a little bit slow to ask for those because of their experience of persecution. Um, but uh, it's reckoned that by 1714 that there were 400,000 dissenters in England, which would be about 8% of the population. So by no means a majority, but a growing and substantial minority. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, Protestant groups could set up their own schools um, and uh, they could set up their own schools. Um, so that would mean that they could educate their, their children to read and write and, and to take part in um, uh, the uh, dissenter forms of worship that they were promoting. However, as I've already said, uh, this is not toleration for Jews or Catholics or Unitarians, people who didn't believe in the Trinity, um, uh, which is a small sect of, uh, of Christianity, but um, Isaac Newton apparently was a Unitarian, so there were, there were people about, um, and they would all still have to kind of be quite secretive or undercover. There is a feeling that Catholics um, perhaps could uh, worship uh, quietly um, and keep it uh, you know, secret, secretish, um, and wouldn't be actively persecuted, but nonetheless, they're still not allowed out into public. Um, just sort of connected to that, um, they're also excluded now from the throne. So the Bill of Rights um, at the start of the Glorious Revolution actively excluded James II um, and his heirs, his children. Um, and then essentially won the Act of Settlement, which we'll talk about next time as well, um, ended, uh, took all Catholics out of the line of succession. Um, so 57 um, heirs, potential heirs, were removed from the line of succession of monarchs. Um, and the next in line after Anne was then going to be, um, in fact, Sophia, uh, the granddaughter of James I from the House of Hanover. In fact, she dies before Anne does, so it ends up being George I. But they, they, yeah, they literally go through kind of like, who's next? Are they Catholic? Yes, strike them out. Who's next? They're Catholic, strike them out. Um, and further than that, uh, the Act of Settlement also says that the next monarch uh, after Anne would need to be a member, an active member of the Church of England. Um, and this also suggests that actually, although uh, toleration was tolerated, that, uh, that they did want their monarch to be Anglican rather than a dissenter, perhaps suggesting that they weren't completely happy with William III's uh, Dutch Calvinism. And uh, there were also limits to, uh, so limits to toleration uh, of the monarchs, certainly, and limits to toleration uh, within the Toleration Act too. So um, although they could worship freely in their unlocked meeting houses, which were licensed beforehand, they still, all people still had to pay the tithe, the tax that went directly to keeping up the Anglican church. Um, and so if you were a Quaker, for instance, uh, well, that's a bad example, but um, let's roll with it. If you're a Quaker, for instance, you are still paying a tax to the Church of England um, to sustain the, the local church building um, and to sustain the clergyman that went to staff it, as well as perhaps paying towards the upkeep of your own meeting house. Um, uh, you wouldn't have a leader because the Quakers didn't have leaders. But yeah, if you were a, a Congregationist or a Baptist, you might also be paying towards the leadership of your own church, as well as contributing to the leadership of the Anglican Church. So that's kind of an oddity. Um, and uh, you still, as a dissenter, could not get a public job because the Test Act remains in place. And for that, 
you had to be an active member of the Church of England, or you had to go along to the Church of England. So you couldn't be an MP, uh, hold a public office uh, like that, a you know, judge or a local magistrate, and you couldn't go to university or practice medicine or law. So um, there are um, very much limits to that toleration, and hence the debate. You know, is this revolutionary? Is it not revolutionary? Is it revolutionary? Yes, it is revolutionary because um, it's, it opens the floodgates. It allows for the proper licensing of dissent uh, and nonconformity. And from this, we can see um, the real growth, the steady growth to the um, amelioration of Protestant groups that we have in England today. Um, however, in other ways, it's not really um, a revolution because there is still control over what those dissenters can do. They might be able to worship freely, but they can't. Uh, they don't have freedom um, as people, as citizens within the UK. They're subjects, of course, but citizens within the UK. And um, don't forget that under James II, actually, uh, there was quite a lot of religious toleration too, um, and arguably more religious toleration because Catholics um, were free to worship and had public jobs at that time. So the limits to toleration are pretty um, pretty well defined in this. Um, I hope that helps and uh, I'll see you next time when we'll talk about the political ramifications of the Glorious Revolution. See you then.